Come, baby. Enjoy this great game. Welcome to another edition of MLB Hall of Fame Snubs. This is a follow-up to my video on the top 10 Hall of Fame snubs. And in this video, we'll discuss 10 more Hall of Fame snubs on top of the 10 that I've already talked about. This list, like the other, will avoid players with steroid connections and banned players. This is not to say that I don't think Barry Bonds, Roger Clemens, and others should be in the Hall of Fame, but at least we know why they're not in. This list will contain players who should be in the Hall of Fame, but for some reason or another, can't seem to get in. If there's a player I miss in this video who you feel deserves to be in the Hall of Fame, there's a good chance that he was mentioned in my top 10 snubs video. The link to that video will be in the description below and posted on the screen at the end of this video. So if you haven't seen my top 10 snubs, check it out after this video, which will contain my numbers 20 through 11. I want to thank everyone who commented on my last snubs video with the names of so many great players who the voters have snubbed. I'll show some of your comments throughout this list today. So here we go, and let's start with number 20, Roger Maris. Although Roger Maris didn't make my top 10, he is the player I've been fighting over for the longest, going back to my childhood, arguing with friends over whether Roger Maris was a Hall of Famer or not. I'll continue to say now what I said then, Roger Maris should be in, and not just for the amazing 1961 season in which he broke Babe Ruth's single season home run record of 60. He also won an MVP that year, but one great season does not a Hall of Famer make. But wait, Roger Maris won an MVP in 1960 as well when he hit 39 home runs and led the league with 112 runs driven in while winning a gold glove. He also made four consecutive All-Star teams during this time and he ended up winning multiple World Series rings with both the Cardinals and Yankees. However, there is no doubt that his overall career numbers don't look Hall of Fame worthy. Nevertheless, many players are denied entry because they lacked moments of greatness or lacked an MVP award. Maris has two MVP awards and he broke a home run record held by Babe Ruth, a record that was held for 40 years. I understand those who say his 275 career home runs and 1,325 hits are just not good enough and I would normally agree, but the two MVP awards, four straight All-Stars, and a record-breaking 1961 season make those career numbers just good enough as far as I'm concerned. Roger Maris is an all-time legend, and he should be in. Number 19, Omar Vizquel. Since Vizquel's retirement, I've always insisted that if Ozzy Smith is a first-time no-brainer Hall of Famer, Vizquel certainly should get in at some point. The basic facts of his career are simple, 24-year career with nearly 3,000 hits and 11 gold gloves. That sounds like more than enough to me. Unfortunately, since his retirement, Vizquel has been involved in some domestic violence scandals, and this has basically ruined any chance he has of ever getting in. Nevertheless, when just focusing on his career, I still think Vizquel is a Hall of Famer. His insanely good defense and incredible acrobatic ability at shortstop helped him win 11 gold gloves, and many of his defensive stats look even better than the Wizard. For instance, Vizquel made far less errors even though he played in more games. But I would say they are both comparable defensively, both flashy, fun to watch, extremely reliable in the field, and offensively, Vizquel wasn't exactly Babe Ruth, but he retired just 123 hits short of 3,000 and had a decent 272 average with over 400 stolen bases. He also showed amazing longevity with a 24-year career, and when all the pieces are put together, at least before any of the scandals occurred after his retirement, of which I don't have all the details, Omar Vizquel certainly deserves a plaque. Number 18, Kenny Lofton. One of the most shocking one-and-done cases I can remember, Kenny Lofton fell off the ballot in 2013 after receiving less than 5% of the vote. By no means did I expect him to be a first-year Hall of Famer, but that was completely mind-blowing for a guy who retired with over 2,400 hits and 600 stolen bases to go along with six All-Star selections and four gold gloves, and those are just the stats that are easy to look up. If you dig deeper, which I suspect voters rarely do, Lofton starts looking like a shoe-in. Among fellow center fielders, he has the ninth best war ever, which is mind-blowing. 
Indeed, the majority of those ahead of him are all-time legends like Willie Mays and a surefire future Hall of Famer in Mike Trout. How good was Lofton? He hit 299 in his career, which proved he knew how to hit, but he also worked 945 walks and he retired with an on-base percentage of 372. He knew how to get on base, then make pitchers sweat. He created rallies and helped his team win games like few other superstars could. He was also a human highlight reel in the field, constantly robbing hitters of would-be home runs. He had amazing athleticism to go along with superb baseball talent. It is an absolute crime he was kicked off the ballot after one year. When considering how vital he was to his teams, his 2,400 hits and career 299 average are more than good enough. Lofton should be in. Number 17, Dale Murphy. Next up is Dale Murphy, who, like Roger Maris, was able to win consecutive MVP awards, which is an incredibly impressive feat that not many of the greats of the game have been able to accomplish. During Murphy's prime, he made seven all-star teams in eight years and was one of, if not, the most feared hitter in the game. For four straight years, he hit at least 36 home runs with never less than 100 RBIs. He won four Silver Sluggers as well during this time, but what makes him a Hall of Famer in my book is when you combine this insane offensive output with an elite glove that helped him earn five consecutive gold gloves. He also stayed on the field and for a decade he never played in less than 153 games each season and this included a four-year stretch when he played in all 162 games per year. So what is the problem? Unfortunately, his numbers took a dive by his mid-30s and Murphy was unable to accumulate the career milestones that voters look for, like 500 home runs and 3,000 hits. Completely arbitrary numbers. He ended up with 398 home runs and 2,111 hits. However, when a player dominates an entire decade, both offensively and defensively, and wins back-to-back -back MVPs along the way, I don't really care if he passed some arbitrary figure with his final stats. Dale Murphy should be in the Hall of Fame. Number 16, George Van Haltren. Shout out to God Dog of Vice for mentioning this player who I've only heard of because I'm a Giants fan, but after doing some extra research, I've realized he should absolutely be in the Hall of Fame. When looking at his career stats and considering the era he played in, it's shocking he's not in. Early players of the game used to get in the Hall of Fame with career stats that would look pitiful compared to your average Hall of Famer. But Val Haltren's stats actually look rather beefy. He had over 2,500 hits and a career 316 batting average to go along with elite defensive stats, including leading the league in assists three times. He could also pitch if needed and retired with a 4.05 ERA over 689 innings of work. On the list of similar batters at Baseball Reference, eight of the 10 players are in the Hall of Fame. And of the two that aren't, one is Kenny Lofton, who is also on this list, and the other, Jimmy Ryan, retired with over 2,500 hits and a batting average over 300, and is also arguably a Hall of Fame snub. The most similar to him is Fred Clark, who retired with a batting average four points lower and two less home runs. Most of their stats are extremely similar, but Fred has a plaque and George doesn't, and I honestly have no idea why not. Based on the era and when compared to his peers, George Van Haltren should absolutely be in the Hall of Fame. Number 15, Jim Edmonds. This is a tough case as Jim Edmonds doesn't have most of the splashy career numbers and he's never won an MVP. However, when players are dominant on both sides of the ball for a prolonged period of time, I think voters should give them more credit. Jim Edmonds had a six-year peak that started in the year 2000 where he was absolutely elite and one of the best overall players in the game. Before that time, he had already won two gold gloves and made an all-star team with the Angels. After signing with St. Louis, his career really took off, and Edmonds averaged 35 home runs a year for the next six years while winning six straight gold gloves and making three more all-star teams. 
He knew the strike zone well and could get on base with frequency, consistently ending the season with an on-base percentage over 400. He would have led the league in many offensive categories and made many more all-star teams if he wasn't competing with known steroid users throughout baseball. To my knowledge, there hasn't been any steroid allegations against Jim Edmonds, yet he, like Fred McGriff, does not get rewarded for that, rather punished for either not making enough all-star teams, not winning an MVP, or whatever reason they might have. When he was competing with steroid users who can't get in because they use steroids. So, you can't get in if you were clean because you weren't as good as the steroid users who can't get in because they used steroids. Make that make sense. Jim Edmonds should be in the Hall of Fame. Number 14, Dave Parker. There was a time when Dave Parker was an absolute no doubt future Hall of Famer. He was the most dangerous hitter in the game and one of the best defensive players in the game with a cannon for an arm. He could hit for power but also for average, hitting over 300 for five straight years, maxing out at 338 in 1977. In 78, he hit 334 and won the NL MVP award. He is a seven-time All-Star with three gold gloves and three silver sluggers. Throughout the 70s, Parker was on a clear Hall of Fame track, but in the early 80s, his stats started to fall and he struggled with drug abuse. Still, he had a huge comeback season in 1985 when he hit 34 home runs and led the league with 125 RBIs, making his first All-Star team since 1981. The next year, he drove in another 116 runs with 30 bombs. He then went to Oakland and helped them win a World Series in 1989 before making his final All-Star team with Milwaukee in 1990, hitting 289 with 21 home runs that year. Parker made at least one All-Star team in three different decades, proving his drop-off was not that severe at all. He retired with a 290 average, 2,712 hits, and when combining his dominant decade of the 70s with his very strong seasons of the mid-80s, Dave Parker is without a doubt a 100% Hall of Famer. Number 13, Steve Garvey. Another baffling case I've never understood is that of Steve Garvey, one of the biggest superstars of the 70s who rarely missed a game and consistently led the league in various offensive categories while taking part in some of the most famous moments in baseball history. Steve Garvey feels like a Hall of Famer. And when looking at his stats and awards, you don't have to dig far to ask yourself, why isn't he a Hall of Famer? All-Star games? Check. 10 appearances. Defense? Check. 10 gold gloves. MVPs? Check, 1974 MVP with a second place finish in 1978. Garvey had a squeaky clean image and a celebrity status that most players didn't. He was seen as handsome and charming and there was some talk that maybe he was more worried about his image and fame than actually helping his team win, but the stats don't really show that. He could have easily retired from baseball at any time and started a career as a model, actor, or whatever. He didn't. Garvey played every single day, was absolutely clutch in the playoffs, and by the way, in addition to his NL MVP, he won two All-Star MVPs and two NLCS MVPs. The evidence is overwhelming. There's just too many accomplishments in one career to keep him out, in my opinion, regardless of whatever excuse the voters come up with to try to keep him out. Steve Garvey is simply a Hall of Famer. Number 12, Jeff Kent. As a Giants fan, I had a front row seat to watch Jeff Kent during some of his best years, and somehow, even as a teammate of Barry Bonds, he could steal the show. It is absolutely shocking that he hasn't gotten more Hall of Fame support as voters typically compare players to others who play that same position. Well, Jeff Kent has more home runs than any second baseman in the history of the game. He was also known as a solid defender during his time and certainly passed the eye test, making many diving plays and most of the routine plays with ease. He's a five-time All-Star and a four-time Silver Slugger who played in the midst of the steroid era, somehow still rising to the top despite no evidence or allegations of steroid use. He won the 2000 National League MVP, beating out players like Barry Bonds, Mike Piazza, and Sammy Sosa. Kent was also a clutch hitter in the playoffs, although his team didn't always rise to the occasion with him, such as in the 2006 NLDS, when Kent went 8 for 13 with a huge game-tying home run, but the Dodgers ended up getting swept. He also hit three home runs in the 2002 World Series, but the Giants fell just short. 
At the end of the day, Jeff Kent is one of the best offensive second basemen of all time, has an MVP, has over 2,400 hits, has a fantastic playoff career, and did all this competing against many PED-enhanced players. He should have a plaque. Number 11, Don Mattingly. My number one snub for this video and my number 11 overall is Don Mattingly, a player who I highly considered putting in my top 10. A hit machine of the late 80s, Don Mattingly was one of the best in the game. He made six All-Star teams and won an MVP in 1985 when he drove in an incredible 145 runs. During his prime, he hit well over 300 every season, including a league-leading 343 mark in 1984. Unfortunately, back injuries slowed his progress down, and in the 90s, although he kept trying, his offensive stats really dropped. Despite that, he still managed to win gold glove after gold glove. His defense was elite for over a decade. Mattingly ended up with nine gold gloves. He retired with six All-Star selections and three Silver Sluggers. But because he retired early due to injuries, Mattingly was unable to pad his stats and ended up with only 222 home runs. He still managed over 2,100 hits. And when you take into account the nine gold gloves and the insane peak that Mattingly had, he is a Hall of Famer and should be in. If his playing career alone doesn't get him in, however, he's also had a very solid 10-year managerial career. He won Manager of the Year Award in 2020 with the Marlins. And Donnie Baseball, without a doubt, needs a plaque. And I believe one day he will be in. And there you have it. Ten more Hall of Fame snubs, and there are certainly even more. There are probably at least 50, maybe 60 MLB players who have earned a trip to Cooperstown based on who's already in, yet the voters deny them for whatever reason. Thank you so much for checking out this video, and as always, let me know who else is Hall of Fame worthy. And we'll see if they make my part three list of number 30 through 21. And again, if you haven't already, click that link above and check out my top 10 snubs of all time.